the epistle appointed to, re to be read for this, the Sunday within the octave of the Nativity of our Lord, is taken from St. Paul's epistle to the Galatians. Brethren, as long as the heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave, though he is the master of all. But he is under guardians and stewards until the time set by his father. So we too, when we were children, were enslaved under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law, that he might redeem or receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that he is no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, an heir also through God. And the Holy Gospel is taken from St. Luke. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. At that time, Joseph and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were marveling at the things spoken concerning him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and for the rise of many in Israel, and for a sign that shall be contradicted. And thy own soul a sword shall pierce, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. There was also Anna, a prophetess, daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Azer. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years before from her maidenhood, and by herself as a widow to eighty-four years. She never left the temple, with fastings and prayers, worshiping night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give praise to the Lord and spoke of him to all who were awaiting the redemption of Israel. And when they had fulfilled all things prescribed in the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee, into their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was full of wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Thus for this Sunday's Holy Gospel. There is nothing in particular this morning uh, that in the bulletin to draw attention to, perhaps the only thing being that there will be no catechism class this morning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. My beloved people, we have now reached yet another milestone, and as we approach this particular milestone this year, we approach it not too differently than ever before but certainly with a lot more concern. And we approach it with much fear, too, and apprehension. Not being able to see clearly, though we know clearly, that that which is in store for us is certain, but not quite known. And we approach it with fear and anxiety. We don't know what to do about it. And so we worry. To wish happiness at this time, at this particular time in the history of man, as we normally do, is 
uh, perhaps not quite as heartfelt as it has been in previous years. What is happy about a storm which is coming to us from all directions? We fear and we look and we tremble because of the gravity of the situation. So what do we do? Sit there and just simply shake in our boots in fear and do nothing? No, not quite. You know, every year that uh, we have much to say about New Year's resolutions. They're really not worth the time that it takes to utter them. Everybody makes New Year's resolutions, but nobody can keep them beyond two or three or four days, maybe a week at most, and then it's over and forgotten about until this ceremony takes place again next year. And we don't really grow. We don't really change. We don't really fructify as a tree does or grow into an age of fructification as a tree does. But we remain stunted. Nothing seems to change. We want to become saints. We say that, don't we? All of us want to become saints. We've made a decision, haven't we? that we want to become saints. But how serious is this decision that we have made? Perhaps it might be somewhat similar to the kind of decision that we might make. Now let us see for a second. Oh yes, this year for vacation, uh, let us decide to go to the mountains. And so the decision was made. We go to the mountains. We get in our cars and we go to the mountains. That's the decision that we've made. Very quickly, and that's it. Or perhaps we've decided to go to the seashore. So when the time comes, we get into our cars and we start traveling toward the seashores, or to Europe, or to South America, or to wherever. And so with the same kind, with the same element, the same, can I use the word stuff? The same kind of stuff that we use to make our decision to go to the seashore or to go to the mountain, we make the decision to become saints. That's the decision we've made. And that we think that in such a decision that it takes no more effort than it does to go to the first gasoline pump and put gas in the car turn the ignition, and then start traveling in that direction, toward the mountain, toward the seashore, toward sanctity. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. And we are absolutely fooling ourselves deliriously fooling ourselves that this is what is required to become a saint. I want to be a saint. And so in so doing, I overlook the fact, it's a grim fact, I overlook the fact that in becoming a saint, 
we are talking about the hardest job there is for us to perform. We think that becoming a saint, all that is required of us is simply to say more prayers. That ensures my sanctity. Or that we, to become a saint, I can go to church, I will go to church more often. That ensures my sanctity. Or that if I perform this particular act of devotion or that particular act of devotion, uh, and, it's, and it's told me in the book, if I do that, I'm guaranteed this is a passport to heaven. So I jump into the bandwagon and I perform those wonderful, wonderful devotions. And so I am a saint. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as getting into an automobile and driving to the mountains or driving to the seashore or getting into an airplane and flying over to Europe. It's as simple as that, we think. I'm doing all that is required. I bought my ticket. I paid for it. I packed my bags. I was, I was taken to the airport. I got on the airplane. I behaved myself. And that's all that's necessary, my beloved people. I'm saying all my prayers. I'm being very, very, very careful about that. I wouldn't dare miss my prayers. I wouldn't dare saying grace of missing grace before meals and such like. My beloved people, Yes, prayers are important. Don't misunderstand me. What would I be if I sat here, stood here in front of you and said, no, stop praying? My beloved people, that's not where it is. In measure, of course. But that's not what is going to get me in heaven. The number of rosaries that I say every day certainly are helpful. Don't misunderstand me, please. But my rosaries, my novenas, my masses, my communions are not going to do it all by themselves. Then you ask, then what is going to do it? And here comes the rub. I'm at the base of the mountain. And I've got to get to the top of that mountain. It's very craggy. It's very rocky. It's extremely dangerous and extremely hazardous. My sitting down there at the base of the mountain and simply wishing that I were at the top of that mountain is not going to pick me up by the hair of my head and put me and plant me at the top of that mountain. That will have absolutely no effect, whatever, on the distance between the bottom of that mountain and the top of that mountain. For me to get to the top of that mountain, by the time I get up there, I'm going to be cut and scratched and bleeding and hurting and bruised and everything else. And if I'm going to leave out any one of those things, then forget getting to the top of the mountain. I can pray, I can wear my rosary out at the bottom of that mountain, praying, dear Lord, please take me to the top of that mountain. And after I've worn my rosary out three times, 
I look around and I'm still at the foot of the mountain, am I not? If I want to become a saint, and I must want to become a saint, then I have got to work. And what are some of the works that we're talking about that I've got to look into? What are some of those works? Goodness gracious. Goodness gracious. The list of the things I've got to do. My addictions. What am I doing about my addictions? We think that addictions are to alcohol or to drugs or to food or dessert or chocolate. I'm addicted to chocolate. I'm not really. Don't take my word for that. I'm not. Don't misunderstand me. But I'm just using that as an example. I'm addicted to chocolate. I cannot pass chocolate by without indulging. I cannot pass this drink by without indulging. This can of beer. This, this, this highball. This luscious steak. I cannot pass these things by. We think that our addictions stop at the end of that steak or at the end of that piece of chocolate. Not so, my beloved people, though they are certainly part of them. Those are addictions, no question. Now comes the list. My addiction. Am I addicted to travel? Yeah? I've got to be going someplace all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Come home, turn around and go back. Come home, turn around and go back. Come home, turn around and go back. Is that not an addiction? My addiction to money. And in some cases, this is extremely serious. It's an obsession. Money. I've got to make that profit money. And I read the stock market every single solitary morning. Like a crazy man, looking to see what I have gained since yesterday or what I have lost since yesterday. My addiction to family, which we should be concerned about family, no question about that. I say these things because I want them on tape, less perhaps in the future. But my addiction to family can sometimes become quite ridiculous and to the detriment of those that we claim to love. That we do too much and we give too much. My addiction to noise in the house. Something has got to be moving in the house all the time. And if our house ever became as quiet as a monastery or a convent, which I don't exactly recommend for lay people, you don't have to do that. You don't live in convents and monasteries. We understand that. We make all those allowances. But if it begins to approach that kind of silence, we go batty. If nothing else, we've got to go turn the lawnmower on just so that there's some kind of noise 
around us. Is that not true? Our addiction to automobiles, we've got to have a new automobile every time the moon comes round. Our addiction to clothes. We cannot simply, the idea of going through one day without going through town and going to a dress shop or a suit shop or some kind of shop and start fingering clothing. And, oh, I've just simply got to have this piece. I've just simply got to put, put that piece on. And every day, every day, every day, we're Mr. or Mrs. Fashion. That's an addiction, is it not? And yet, in all of that, we could go on and on and on. And yet we say, we want to be like our blessed mother. And we want to be like St. Joseph. The only serious traveling that the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph ever had to do was a most horrendous trip, wasn't it? They had to walk several hundred miles beginning in the middle of the night and running to keep from getting their little baby killed. And they walked. You know, that's about the only time that we can consider them as being travelers. Can you imagine our blessed mother being a fashionable lady? Can you imagine that? That here she is, and every time you see her, she is Miss Fashion or St. Joseph. Every time you saw him, he had a different robe upon him, or so forth. My beloved people, these are the things that we overlook. We look at other things. Or what about the addiction to our self-will? That's probably the greatest addiction, isn't it? Can we possibly go through an argument once in our lifetime and willingly concede to him who is opposing us just once or twice? Can we do that? Or must it always be that I am right? Our addiction to our misconceived conception of things. And today, more than ever, ever before, uh, with self-styled theologians all over the place, that we are addicted to a Catholicism it is not necessarily what somebody before us had in mind. These are all addictions that we would do anything rather than change. And we pick up all these wonderful religious books and we listen to the sermons, and we read the bulletins, and this, that, and the other. And we say, how wonderful they are, this, that, and the other. But every time we pick up a book and read it, 
and at the end of that book not show at least some partial degree of improvement, then it would have been better for us to have read the funny paper. And in the teaching of our little children, what addictions are we addicted to in the teaching of our little children? What are we presenting to them? Are we presenting to them a way of life that they will be able to live when they become our age? My beloved people, next year, you know, first before I say that, it is not much, it is not often that one priest stays in one location more than six, seven, eight, ten years. It's time for him to move or be moved. For various reasons. Not bad reasons, but various reasons. Just good administrative re reasons. But it is rare that one stays in one location 25 years and next year I will have the, the great grace if God permits it to be in one location for 25 years. And during that period of time, 25 years is a long time, I have seen babies born And I've seen those babies raised under conditions that are just a little much, to put it nicely. And we think that because the twig is not bent, you know, as the twig is bent, the tree is inclined, we think that because we have been so careful in bending this twig just right to such an extent that we have produced a tree that is according to our liking. This is our tree. We have shaped this tree. This tree is my creation. I see in my child, I see me. And me is just exactly what I'm looking for, God forbid. So the tree grows and shapes. When it comes time for that tree to bear fruit, because we have done violence to it and so much violence to it by our own foolishness and preconceived ideas about what a proper tree should be trained like that the tree simply is sterile. In 25 years, my beloved people, please take my word for it. Please take my word for it. I've seen magnificent little children. Who made the sign of the cross perfectly. Who when they went to first when they went to Holy Communion, sanctity glowed from their magnificent, innocent little faces. And now they're gone.
never to return. But we're talking about a things that is about time. The time has arrived for us to stop looking at things through rose-colored glass. And let us put one thing in mind in all of this, even when we're talking about our little children. But for the grace of God, the superabundant grace of God, I would not be standing in this spot at this moment. And but for the grace of God, in superabundance, you wouldn't either. Isn't that a sobering thought, my beloved people? I am here because Almighty God has picked me up and has put me here. Not only has he put me here, he is holding me in place because if he turns loose for one brief second, I'm gone. And which one of us is so foolish as to think that I can stand here on my own? The road to sanctity, my beloved people, demands, please, it demands the hardest possible work imaginable. And my simply wishing it is not going to do it. And my simply talking about it is not going to do it. And my simply teaching it is not going to do it. For me to reach sanctity demands the hardest kind of consistent work not high points today and low points tomorrow. There are those people that today can be at the very peak of holiness. Oh, merciful heavens, what peaks of holiness some people can reach at the flash of an instant, turn the switch on, and they are holiness itself. You see them 10 minutes later and they won't even look at you. So, as we start this year, as we start this very uncertain year, we speak, let us speak of the kingdom of God on earth. We think that the kingdom of God is here on earth. No, didn't our Lord say something like, uh, the prince of this world? If so-and-so is the prince of this world, how can our blessed Lord himself be the, how can this be his kingdom? then where is his kingdom? His kingdom is in my heart. And unless it can be established there, the way he intends for it to be established there, then all of my efforts, I've given myself up to be, my body to be burned, I've given up everything and given to the poor, I've done everything the law has asked of me to do, but I have failed. What a tragedy. All the bankruptcy in the world that we can talk about or think about all put together. Is not equal to the bankruptcy of one's immortal soul. So therefore, with these very cheerful thoughts in mind this morning, 
I wish you the best. I wish us the best. And prayer and preparation is the only thing that you can do, that I can do, in being ready for whatever is outside. For whatever explosion can be outside, for whatever threat can be outside, our prayer can be our protection. It will encase us in a wall of safety. My beloved people, I would like for you to kneel so that I can give you a blessing. That this blessing, my beloved people, will be from us to you. And, and in your turn, put this blessing back upon us. That this blessing will follow us. As weak as I am, and as unworthy as I am, I call upon God to put enough power in my arm to keep you and us safe in the days to come.